Hey everyone, welcome to another webisode of Garden Chat. My name is Mark. I have the greatest pleasure of having Gia, Jennifer, and Kaylee, our team members here at Couple of Firm. Welcome to uh, a webisode that we have titled Gardening and Florida's Beautiful Moths. So it's a free live stream, uh, part of our educational outreach, and we'll be happy to take uh, questions and comments live. So let's jump right into it. Uh, some of the resources that might be helpful for you all, uh, as far as uh, stinging and venomous caterpillars, there is a great IFAS Gardening Solutions blog post uh, about caterpillars that hurt. So just go ahead and Google uh, UFL, University of Florida IFAS, caterpillars that hurt, and that uh, resource will pop right up. Uh, a plant distribution map where, uh, and as far as MOX distribution can be found at bonapp.net. Uh, bug info can be found at bugguide.net. And this wonderful resource that Gia stumbled across, butterflyidentification.org, actually has a tile type a gallery of all the moths that are present, 300 plus and counting here in Florida. So they uh, are developing that. It's a nice resource, a quick visual guide, if you may. And then we want to especially thank our social media friends, notably on Instagram and iNaturalist. Uh, we did our best to uh, do Creative Commons by non-commercial standard license on our images. And we want to also thank the University of Florida's Department of Entomology and the University of Milwaukee. As far as our uh, presenters, we have Jennifer Hopton Villalobo. She is a West Volusia environmental specialist. She is a Lake Helen resident for uh, many years. She grew up there, so she calls West Volusia her home. Uh, Gia Lee Ectel is a Florida wetland plant specialist. And when I mean Florida, I mean Florida. She's everywhere. Uh, so the wetland uh, plant ecosystems definitely speak to her. And Kaylee Adams, is, as many of you know from her helpful and always positive nature, she is a rural Florida preservationist and activist. Uh, she is particularly active in Seminole County's rural area. And uh, some of her webisodes have attracted the attention of city councilors, uh, especially ones in Longwood and Altamont on the other side of the rural boundary line because they do want to hear uh, you know, some of the uh, native plant uh, enthusiasts, and uh, they do tune in and give some of their valuable time to us. So uh, thank you all three for putting this together. Appreciate that. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel. I will be putting that into our uh, chat box really uh, soon uh, with the link, but please subscribe. Uh, your subscription to our YouTube channel is free and it actually helps support us. So please subscribe as soon as you see this and as soon as you see the link in the chat box appear. And join Couple of Ferns. So in case you are a native plant enthusiast, we are serving all of West Volusia, all of Seminole County, all of the North Orlando suburbs that bleed into Seminole County and extreme North Brevard where Gia is. And definitely like and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, in case you guys are uh, remote or distant learners, you can definitely join a couple of firms. We do a lot of online outreach. And even after COVID dissipates, we will continue to do those. So uh, just because you may not be in your area and you feel like a couple of firm may be a good fit for you, uh, go to fnps.org uh, slash join and select a couple of firm from the dropdown. Um, and then I just wanted to put this little graphic in. Uh, so you know that butterflies and moths are related. As many of you probably know, they are from the Lepidoptera order. And this is a very generalized diagram. Uh, so moths diverged from uh, skippers and butterflies very early on. So they are part of a more distant lineage. And when it comes to butterflies and skippers, they are more closely related. So moths are their distant cousins, and then you can consider both flies and skippers close cousins of one another, or relatively closer cousins of one another. And moths are beautiful. They're diverse, they're striking, they're complex, they're seductive, they're awe-inspiring. Uh, there's a great Instagram uh, feed called Fashion Biologic, 
And this is, uh, you know, uh, just pictures of uh, designers that have taken inspiration from the moth world. And it's here, 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 here. This is a clear wing, which is uh, a type of hummingbird moth. And here, uh, this is a very vibrant moth from Madagascar. So they are indeed beautiful. Uh, and some of the, you know, most expensive fashion labels take uh, notice and take inspiration from some of the most humble creatures uh, in our world. And um, I'm going to jump into my slides at this point. So my first uh, moth is oleander wasp moth. So many of you know this moth as being a principal defoliator of uh, oleanders. Um, but it is a biomimicry specialist, so they do look like they're menacing. Uh, they do look like wasps, uh, but they're not. And just like wasps, they are active during the daytime. So uh, they do use that to their advantage. Um, as I mentioned, they are a known defoliator of oleander plants, ornamentals, uh, Rose of Sharon or the Desert Rose is another one. Uh, but its native plant host is the rubber vine, and it is actually found just along the coast in uh, East South Florida. Uh, it is not to be confused with the oleander hawk moth. So hawk moths are different from wasp moths, uh, just so you guys know. And here's the caterpillar on the left. It's yellow, and it looks like it has very uh, menacing bristles, but uh, that's just for show as well. Uh, they're totally fine. They may be a little spiky, but they they will definitely not sting you. Uh, as far as the adult, it's deep blue black. It has white speckles and has a burnt orange abdomen. Um, here, are what the uh, eggs look like on the far left, and that's actually a oleander leaf. Uh, the middle is actually the native host, the rubber vine. So. If you guys are looking at the flower right here, you can tell that it kind of resembles Vinca or Madagascar peri periwinkle. And that's because both plants are actually in the Apocynaceae uh, family. And this moth, even though its principal larval host plant is the rubber vine, uh, has leaped to the oleander plant because it also is part of the Apocynaceae family. So they are, they are kind of, uh, you know, taking advantage of uh, sister genus species. And if they can eat it uh, and tolerate it, they will eat it. So that's what's going on with oleander wasp moth. It's not their uh, target plant, but if they find it uh, more so in your landscape, then that's what they will use as their larval host. And these are what the uh, caterpillar and pupa, uh, pupate into. Um, has a burned orange with black uh, speckles and streaks. And my next one is one that is found pretty much everywhere in Central, South, and North Florida, especially in the peninsular area. And this is the red-waisted Florella moth. And it's rather small. It's a wingspan of only 15 millimeters. Uh, and it's called a snout-nosed moth, and it's actually right there. That is the snout. And uh, it's part of a very diverse family uh, called the Crambidae family. And um, they're found all over the world. Sometimes they're very hard to differentiate between one another. Uh, but the snout-nosed moth gets its name from the uh, snout-like projection of its mouth parts. Um, and it's native across many parts of the Americas. Uh, its native host plant is our false buttonweeds, the native as well as the non-native ones, spermacosis species, and it is a known pest of some ornamentals. So anything in the Rubiaceae family, just like you have for the uh, oleander uh, wasp moth, uh, anything within uh, the Rubiaceae family, which is the coffee, mallow, and bed straw, plants, uh, they will use that as their larval host. So guess what falls in the Rubiaceae family? We'll touch base on that just in a moment. Um, 
but here is a, a, an image of the caterpillar, pale green. And the circle up here actually shows you how small it is. It's just a, a kind of a ru ruler scale, for the lack of a better word, and it's just one millimeter in size. So this is a rather small caterpillar, and this is the adult, uh, you know, with brown wings and bright yellow spots and a bright orange abdomen. Uh, but here it is. Here is your problem. So these are actually pentas, which are uh, very uh, commonly used in our gardens, and they actually f are part of the Rubiaceae family. So here you have our uh, caterpillar munching on a non-target plant, but it says, fine, if you don't have my target plant, I can use this one. And here's your target plant, spermacosi species, and here is what the uh, pupa look like. Really small. Here again, I have uh, shown you a small ruler to scale, and that's just one millimeter. And the uh, pupa has wrapped itself, uh, you know, among the leaf. And here's penta. So if you have this um, pepper-like uh you know um characteristic on your flowers on the tips of your flowers right here you can see them on the uh, flowers itself this is actually the frass of your wasp so your florella moth wasp is munching around on your pentas and this is the uh poop for the lack of a better word of your florella moth so um those would be, and I actually I do have another one. It's the puss moth. And this is a rather notorious moth. The puss moth is also known as the southern flannel moth. And it is infamous. It is the one that uh, makes it into the news. Uh, it's not as prevalent as it is in Texas, but we do find it here. Uh, and it is renowned for its painful, painful caterpillar envenomation, also known as erucism and it's native across Southeast and Central America. And you can't really avoid this uh, particular moth. If it's found in your area, chances are you'll just have to study it, acknowledge it, understand its behavior, and respect its space. Uh, its host plants are many, are many and varied. Uh, here in Florida, they uh, larvate on elm, oak, persimmon, among many others. Uh, so being informed and educated is the best protection there is. And here are the uh, infamous uh, barbs of the puss moth caterpillar. So this is actually taken from an excellent, excellent publication by the University of Florida, put together by Donald Hall, and it is often cited. And um, he did just an excellent, excellent job on a very uh, rather painful and dangerous uh, caterpillar moth. So these are its uh, spines, for, uh, for the lack of a better word. This is one of its larval host plants, uh, the persimmon. And here is what its cocoon looks like. So uh, the last part of it, megalopi, Opercularis actually talks about the operculum, which is where the final moth will break out and exit from. So it's almost like a little flap. So this is the area that the um, moth will exit out of. And they're rather small. So these are, you know, again, you know, one millimeter right here, really small. And each of these is an egg. So it's really, really tiny. And this is one of its earliest instars, really fuzzy looking, kind of inviting. You want to pet it, but bad idea. Don't do that. And uh, this is what people are used to. This is one of its late instar stages, and it's ready to form its cocoon. Uh, but yes, when you see this, don't touch it at all. <laughs> Leave it alone, okay? Uh, it gives very, very painful uh, 
envenomation uh, bites, the erucism from it is something that you will remember and respect uh, if you're ever affected by it. And that's uh, the circled area is what uh, gives this entire genus its name, megalopi, meaning big rump. So here is the rump of the uh, caterpillar. So this is megalopi, and then the earlier images showed you why it was called a percularis. And those would be my slides. I believe it's uh, Jennifer's turn. All right, hello. So this is about the rosy maple moth, and I chose it because it's super cute and pretty. And um, I also like maple trees, so um, that's a bonus. You gotta get the maple tree and then you get the maple moth. And um, this is part of the silk moth family. I think it's Saturn, Saturnalia or something like that. Um, and they are also found on oaks. Um, I read it was particularly turkey oaks that they, um, they like, aside from the uh, maples. And they're variable in color from white to the brilliant yellow pink that's in the picture. Um, but that's, um, that's the most common one that you'll see because it's a protective coloration. Uh, other predators, when they see brightly colored insects, will um, assume that it's poisonous and not want to eat it. They have sensory receptors in the antenna, legs, and palps. Um, the males have um, bushier antenna than the females because the males um, want to find their mate, and that's how they will find them. So that's one way to identify the male from the female is through the the antenna. Um, the adults do not eat. They, uh, their only purpose is to reproduce and um, they are harmless. So you don't have to worry about getting stung by them. So there's a picture of the, that must be a male because the uh, antenna are bushier than the females. And um, let's see. Oh, there's another one. I just wanted to share cute pictures of the moth. I saw that online. Um, there's a lot of artists that make like maple moth dolls and there's paintings and things like that. So this is a very popular moth with people. All right. Go ahead and the next one. Um, Oh, okay, so the caterpillars are, they have a different name than the, um, the adult. The adult is called the um, maple moth and the caterpillar is called um, the, oh my goodness. Oh, green striped maple worm, there we go. And so they lay a lot of leg, eggs on the underside of the maple leaf and they all eat together and stay underneath. And I know a lot of people get concerned when there's caterpillars eating their plants, but really plants have evolved to handle predation from insects and herbivorous animals. So it really doesn't harm the plant and those caterpillars are bird food. So it's all just part of the cycle and this is something we should let be. Just let them live their lives and enjoy the cycle as it goes. Um, these caterpillars will eat as much as they can until they, they grow to their final instar and then they drop down to the ground and they burrow into the soil. So it's really important to have spaces in your yard where caterpillars can burrow down into the ground. So if you have a lot of asphalt or if your turf is too thick, they're not gonna be able to find a place to complete their life cycle. And the majority of the life cycle is the, um, the pupation stage when they're changing from caterpillar to uh, moth. Go to the next one. Right, and there's a, um, a more mature 
caterpillar. So you see it's got the red head and it's got spikes on it, but they are harmless. It's an extension of their skin. They're um, called tubercles, I think. I have notes, but there are a lot of notes. So there's also um, a picture of the, when they grow, they shed their skin. And so that's the shed skin at the top, bottom left. And then below that is the, um, the, the cocoon. So that's when they're um, pupating. So they're not, it's not a scale picture, so it's not, um, you know, the size. But I notice when I'm digging around in the soil that there's a lot of different, I, I find them all the time. So it's a really common looking um, cocoon. And where's the other one? The other picture? Okay. So then one final picture of the caterpillar chewing on a maple leaf. And go ahead to the next one. Okay, so there's a maple tree. And that's a maple tree that's during fall, but it looks like it's a little confused because it's got seeds to it, but it was just a really pretty picture of a maple. Um, so when if you want to see these um, caterpillars, the, um, the mature moths emerge around mid-May to mid-July in Florida, and the females lay three broods from March to October. Um, and their OV position when they're laying their eggs, that peaks in early July. Uh, the female lays 150 to 200 eggs on the underside of leaves. So if you are wanting to find them that's the time period when you'll want to go outside and search for them in a maple tree. Um, you'll want to do that in the early dusk hours or within the first two hours after it gets dark. Right. And that is a turkey oak. That, that's the other tree that they prefer if they don't have maple around. But it also said um, that they will eat oak as well. So oak is one of those capstone species. And I showed a picture of the scrub jay because scrub jays live on habitats where turkey oaks exist and scrub jays and other birds eat the caterpillars of the maple moth and other caterpillars. That's a important food source for birds. So next is yucca moths, and um, the two, there's a lot of different species of yucca moths. They are all over the country. Yucca plants have traveled through um, humans moving them. They're a, a popular yard plant because they have these beautiful inflorescences um, when they bloom. Um, that could be like 300 flowers on one stalk and so, and they're drought tolerant. And in Florida, we have the, um, the Adams needle and um, I know there's yucca filamentosa and um, Spanish bayonet. So those are the two native Florida yucca plants. And the two most common yucca moths are Tegeticula cassandra and Tegeticula yuccasella. There are also um, moths that are kind of like cheaters. So they will go into the yucca plant and they won't serve the pollination services that the yucca moths do. So what's, I really thought that this was um, an interesting relationship that they have. They, um, they're obligate, obligate pollination mutual mutualism between the yucca moths and the yucca plants and what that means is they can't live without each other they can't exist without each other they've evolved for millions of years together um and the in the relationship the moth the female moth 
goes to the yucca plant when it's time to um, lay her eggs. And she she's able to sense if another moth has been there with um, pheromones that they leave behind. They rub their abdomens along the, um, the pistil of the flower. And so they'll, they'll crawl around in there and sniff for that. And if, there, if, if it's a good flower and there's no other eggs, they'll lay the eggs in there. Um, but they have to lay it in a certain spot because if the plant detects that there's too much weight, it'll drop the flower and then the caterpillars will not get their food because the caterpillars need to eat seeds, not the flower, not the leaves. It has to be seeds. So that means that this moth has to intentionally pollinate the flower in order for her caterpillars to eat. And um, this has only been discovered in four other species of pollinators. Uh, that's all that's known. And um, three of them are moths and the other ones, the, um, the wasp that um, pollinates the fruit. Um, I forgot the name of the fruit. Um, it's a common fruit we eat. <laughs> um, so she um, scrapes the pollen off of the, um, off of the, the flower and she makes a ball and it's supposed to be 10 percent of their body weight and they carry it to another flower and they put it on the um the stamen wait not the stamen the um the stamen's the part with the pollen so they put it on the um pistol. oh my gosh pistol thank you <laughs> so they put it on the pistol intentionally and so it's pollinated so her eggs are laid on it and she leaves and she just repeats that until she dies. And um, so once the flower makes its fruit, the caterpillars hatch and eat the um, seeds in it. Um, so I think that's a really amazing relationship. And once um, you can go ahead to the next slide. So there's a picture of the, um, oops. Do you wanna go back to that one that shows like the anatomy of the flower? So I, I guess that would have been important. So you can see like on the anatomy of the flower, the, um, the center portion is the female part, the pistil, and then the outer parts that are protruding from the center is the male part, that's the uh, stamen. And you can kind of see the yellow pollen that's on it. So it's just a little, you know, white moth, nothing really flamboyant about her. All right, go ahead to the next one. And the, um, the caterpillars, they're just little white, ugly things. And they have um, special mouth parts. They're like tentacle like. So, um, the adults don't eat. She just uses that mouth part, and that's what makes her special. Is she's able to um, use that mouth part to put the pollen into the um, pistil, and um, she's also able to use that to carry the um, the uh, pollen ball because it's a really big pollen ball compared to their body weight. Right. And here are some pictures. There's the, um, the anatomy labeled on the yucca flower. Um, so it's like a cross section of the flower. And then on the other side, it's showing the larva inside of the seed of the, or the fruit. And when they're all done, um, they, they eat their way out of the seed and drop to the ground and burrow into the soil. And, um, there's another picture that is a really great detail showing the special mouth part that sticks into the pistol. And um, some of them will lay their uh, eggs on the stalk and others will lay their eggs on the, um, within the flower. But they, um, when they lay it within the flower, it has to be just a few or else the plant will detect the weight and drop it. 
Hmm. Are there any more? Okay, so there's the one. So that's showing a picture of the caterpillar burrowing out of the um, seed. It, it eats its way out of the seed, drops to the ground. And then, um, so some of them will hatch after overwintering one year, but others will not hatch. And this is a way to ensure that they they survive if the plant fails to flower because sometimes the plant won't flower and if they all hatch in one year then they won't be able to um, survive. So um, if it fails one year, the next brood that hatches the next year will uh, hopefully survive. And then the last one is the hickory horn devil larva. Uh, which also, um, that's what it's called when it's a larva because it's just so unique as a larva. It just has a totally different name than the adult, which is regal moth. So it looks like this crazy dragon caterpillar. Um, but those spikes on it are, um, they're not dangerous. They won't hurt you. They're just extensions of their, their skin pretty much. Um, and it's meant to obviously scare off predators because it looks like it's poisonous and that it will sting you and they can raise up in positions to make them look very fierce. Um, so these get very large. They're one of our largest moths and they're probably our largest caterpillar. Um, they're described as hot, almost hot dog sized at its last instar. And this is when people most often see it. That's when I saw it, because um, I've seen them one time and it was crawling across the ground. And um, they're so big, their their skin is tight and um, shiny and they have to burrow into the soil. And so this is another one where you wanna make sure that you have some spot where they can burrow if, you know, if they're, if they're looking for somewhere to burrow on concrete or the thick turf or super thick um, mulch or something like that, they might have trouble finding a place to finish their cycle. Uh, so it may be a, appear fierce, but it is harmless. Um, so these moths, so there's the moth. I think it's a very beautiful moth and it's got adorable orange fur. Um, there we go. Okay, so each instar is different. The last instar is bright turquoise with red uh, to orange horns. And um, mature moths, if you want to find these, they emerge around mid-May to mid-July in Florida. Females lay three broods from March to October. So this is a time period where you could go looking on their host plants and maybe you'll get to see the caterpillar and maybe you'll get to see the moth when it's laying its eggs. You'd have to go again, you know, the early night hours is the, it seems to be the time period when most moths like to have their activities. Um, Avi position peaks in early July and she laid, the female lays 150 to 200 eggs on the undersides of leaves. Not all caterpillars will make it to adulthood. Remember, they serve an important role in the food chain. Caterpillars are food for birds and other animals. And um, let's see, I'll go ahead to the next one. So there's a picture of someone holding the um, the caterpillar in their hand. They're harmless. And um, then there's one final picture of the um, the regal moth. And let's see. I just want to make sure. Oh, the adults they don't eat. So their only purpose is for reproduction. Also, they have vestigial mouth parts. Their host plants are in the walnut family. In Florida, that's hickories. And another host is the persimmon. Uh, what's really great about persimmon is they're also a host plant for luna moths and many other moths. They're, they seem to be something that a lot of moths favor. 
And um, these also, the hickory is one of the trees that we um, featured in the fall colors. So yeah, it looks like a lot of these, um, these fall colored trees are also host plants. All right. Hey guys. Hey, so my first moth that I'm presenting on is the Terso Sphinx. And um, it's a very, very cool moth. It's, it's a really interesting looking one to me. Um, they kind of look like little fighter jets to me with their little aerodynamic bodies and kind of cool shaped four wings. Um, the example that you see here on this page is a pin specimen. So you don't normally see them. You don't normally see the hind wings like this. Normally when they sit, they kind of sit in a way to where it's kind of folded up underneath them. Um, let me see if I can get a, another picture here to show you. So here's kind of a side view for you. And so you can kind of see they've got a very thick body. They have, they're covered in this fur, which what that fur actually is, is it's modified scales. So it's not, not really fur like what you or I would have, or, but, but they are a type of modified scale. Um, and it helps with a couple different things. It helps with keeping them warm. It could help with flight. So there's a few different re reasons they have that. So just to kind of, you know, they these the, the adult moths all kind of look very similar. Um, they can have a little bit of variances in their color and patterns, but not a whole lot. But these wings are like this kind of bark brown color and kind of like the cinnamon colored body. Um, and they have these lines that kind of go along the back you can see um, all, all the way down to the tail that tapers to a point all right the caterpillar of this species is kind of cool it kind of um reminds me of the um what do you call it the uh giant swallowtail or um the mm, spice bush swallowtail that kind of mm -hmm. has like the big head that and they do like the snake mimic thing where it's kind of like an enlarged head and they've got the very large prominent eye spots so this is not a poisonous or venomous caterpillar this is one that um, in order to protect itself it kind of raises its head up and it's got those big scary eye spots um, which can be pretty threatening to um, to a bird this one's also got eye spots that kind of go along the body as well so, oh, there's a close-up of his face. Isn't he cute? <laughs> so you can see his actual face right here. There's a little, you know, little noggin right here. And then his big old eye spots. Really cool looking critter. Okay. And so this kind of shows you, like, it's also got the eye spots that go along the sides. Um, and they can vary in color a little bit as caterpillars. So you can see the first ones I showed you were kind of green. This one is... Um, kind of in the middle, kind of like a brown color. This one is super dark. This one is a very, very dark um, colored caterpillar. All right, so in this one, it sounds like it's kind of similar with a lot of caterpillars. I don't know if they're all this way, but this is another one where, you know, once it kind of gorges itself on its host plant and it's mature, you know, it climbs down to the ground and it burrows under those loose leaves and soil and builds its cocoon under there. So. I mean, we're kind of seeing over and over again for moth species, this is very, very important to have like, you know, some loose leaf litter, maybe not break your leaves sometimes <laughs> and kind of leave that there for your moth friends. They, they need that. They can't do it on concrete um, or in, in a lawn. They need loose soil and leaf litter in order to complete their life cycle. So, and here's a picture of what their cocoon looks like. Um, you can see the soil around it is, you know, pretty nice loose soil. So, and as far as like their host plants, they've got a few. This one is smooth false buttonweed is probably one of the main ones. Um, there's one that looks very similar in Florida that is an invasive species. So 
they're, they can be kind of challenging to tell apart, but you know, if you kind of um, practice a little bit, you can kind of tell which is which. Um, but this species is really, I think it's more so found in the panhandle area, if I'm not mistaken, this smooth false button weed. So in most parts of Florida, you may not find it. But there are some other things that you might find um, in your area, Virginia buttonweed. Um, this one is located in many, many parts of Florida. So this is more of like a wetland plant. You might see this along water edges and wet areas. Um, and then buttonbush is a really popular um, plant that you can get at native nurseries. Many native nurseries carry this, but it is also a wetland plant. But this is also a host plant for them. And then this one is a new one for me. I didn't, I hadn't heard of this one before. It's called Southern Catalpa, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And this one, um, this one also isn't found all over Florida, but I think it's more north, maybe northwest, central, if I'm remembering correctly. I forget exactly off the top of my head. But this one's an interesting one also. So, you know, if you have these in your yard already or um, if any of it is available at a native nursery and you want to pick it up, that could be a way that you could attract these to your yard. And they also um, are moths that feed as well so as adults. So um, some moths don't. Some are, don't have mouth parts and they cannot feed as adults. These do, and they specifically like flowers that are kind of like deep-threaded flowers like firebush and cory honeysuckle, uh, coral honeysuckle and stuff like that. Um, also, various night blooming flowers, they enjoy that also. Okay. This one is a cool one. Um, this one is the hummingbird moth or hummingbird clear wing. One thing that's a little bit different about this one is it is active during the day. So it could be easy to confuse this with a very large bumblebee or a very small hummingbird if you just see it kind of buzzing around. Its wings do beat very, very fast, just like a hummingbird, although maybe slightly slower than a hummingbird, but still very, very fast. So that's one telltale sign that that's, you know, what you're seeing. Um, and they like a lot of the same flowers that hummingbirds do also, right? And these are very um, interesting looking uh, uh, moths with their kind of green, green bodies, like they have this olive green colored body. Um, and on their tail here, it's either red or red and green. And they're, um, they have this little flared part at the end of their tail, which actually serves to disperse pheromones during like breeding. So that's kind of the purpose of this little area that can kind of fan it and blow it in the air. <laughs> and um, one interesting thing about their wings, you see it's clear right here. That's how they get their name, hummingbird clear wing. But what's happening right here is um, when it's when it first comes out of its cocoon and it's emerging, um, their wings are actually a solid color. They're a solid, very dark, reddish black color. And then during its first couple flights, these scales fall off. So you're just kind of seeing what's underneath here. So that's why these wings are clear. And some of the other um, moths that are in a similar family um, have this feature also. So that's actually scales that have fallen off right in the middle there, okay? So that's kind of a, kind of an interesting thing. So here's a side view, super cute. They look almost like little flying shrimps, very adorable. <laughs> um, but they, you can see how they could, you know, mimic hummingbirds pretty easily. They've even down to the tail and even down to the green colors on them. And, and down to the same flowers. It's very interesting. Oh. And um, here they are as a caterpillar. This is also a caterpillar that is, um, you know, I, I wouldn't advise just going and scooping them up and cuddling them or anything, but it's not gonna hurt you if you touch it, one of those things, all right? So this is one that you don't have to fear that you're going to grab it and it's going to sting you. All right, so they're, they're mostly green. This is his little face right here. Um, they can come in slightly different colors. They kind of have some different color variations also. You can see this one's kind of a little bit, it's got some green and some pink on it, right? And this one is very pink. Um, and characteristic of the Sphinx moth family, this one is also in, this, in the Sphinx moth family, just like the, um, the Tursa Sphinx that I showed you. 
And it's and this little tail, this little point on the tail is, is characteristic of a lot of caterpillars in this famous moth family. So you can see it's got that little tail right there too. All right, and some of the host plants, one, of, one really common one that a lot of people might like to have in their yards um, is viburnums. Viburnums is probably the biggest, most popular um, host plant for these moths. And um, they prefer this over most other things, but some of the other things that they will use if this is not available, um, they also will host on coral honeysuckle and they will host on um, coral berry, which is um, not super common in Florida, but this is another one that they will host on. And also various um, blueberry species, which I didn't get a picture of, but also some of the nectar plants that they enjoy. So these are all very common, the um, spotted bee balm, phlox, Florida does have some native phlox species. Um, uh, of course, coral honeysuckle, they like that as well. The uh, porter weed, this is thistle. Um, these are all very popular with hummingbird clear wings. So if you would like to attract them to your yard so that you can see them, those are all great plants for that. So, and also remember, you know, these are day flying. So unlike some other moths, it's kind of cool. You can probably have a better chance of, you know, catching these outside if you plant what's right for them. Okay. And this is probably my absolute favorite. And I think because this is this got me a little bit, I, I have kind of like a side interest in entomology aside from you know native plants. And this is this is what inspired me to get into that. This this was an IO moth that I found on my deck. And this is a male IO moth. Uh, you can tell the difference because the um, male has these yellow forewings. Um, and the female has brown four wings, and I'll show you um, uh, pictures in a moment here, all right? But you can see like on the back, on their hind wings, they've got this really glorious eye spot that looks just like an eye, and it's even got the reflection right there to startle um, predators. And so this when I first found him, he wasn't in this position. When I first found him, let me see, he looked like this, all right? And then I got up close and uh, and then he flipped his front wings up and I have to admit, it actually did startle me because <laughs> I wasn't expecting um, to see two eyeballs staring back at me. So it was really cool. Um, but normally when they're just at rest, that this is what they look like and it's their their pattern is meant to blend in with leaves on the forest floor so they spend um they are a night um, night flying moth so during the day they're very inactive they spend the day still and just blending in with the leaves um until nighttime comes around and you know about the same with like a lot of other night flying moths you know it's about nine ten o'clock is when they start to emerge and and they start to release their pheromones and start calling for mates. All right. So um, I'll go ahead and bring up another few pictures here. So this is the female. You can see it's very different than what the male looks like. You can see there. And um, one other thing that's a little bit different about these, these are moths that do not feed. Um, so they're pretty widespread, but you may not see them very often. They only live one to two weeks. That's it. So they live just long enough to reproduce and and then they're done for. So um, these do not feed as adults. So there's no nectar plants for them. Um, they've got a ton of host plants though, which I'll show you in a minute. So here's their, I found a picture of their eggs, which I was excited about because they're pretty distinctive. Um, they're kind of like this, yellowish color on the bottom and then like a whitish color on top and this little black dot um it's not there initially like when the eggs are first laid it's kind of clearish or yellowish in that area and then um, i think it's like the next day or so is when it starts to turn black and that's when you know the eggs are fertile if they were not fertile eggs it wouldn't turn colors so this actually means that they're developing so this is a picture of the the eggs right here So when they first hatch, they're this color. They look um, 
kind of like this orangish greenish color. This is an early instar. And these, you'll notice they do have little spiky things on them. These are a stinging caterpillar. You do not want to handle these at all. It's a very painful sting. I don't know if it's as bad as the pus caterpillar, but it's probably up there. All right. So you do not want to um, accidentally grab onto this. All right. Um, one cool thing, actually a, cool, a few cool things about these larvae when they're kind of in their first, like early instars, they, they have some odd behaviors. One odd behavior that they have is that they will kind of parade around the leaves um, or their host plants um, head to tail. They kind of like make a little train and they follow each other around. And they do this by kind of like making little silk trails. And so they kind of follow the silk trails, but they're just kind of head to toe and they just kind of move around their host plant that way. And so they kind of stay in these groups. Um, a lot of the caterpillars, like when they're born, they just kind of, they're on their own and they just do their thing. These guys group together like this and they, they just like to, like, they like to chill. So <laughs> they stay together. One theory is that um, they look more threatening in bigger numbers. So that's one theory um, as to why they stay in groups like this when some of their stone. Another weird thing that they do, and I suspect that this photo that we're looking at might be an example of it, but they, they do this thing where they kind of get into a rosette type of pattern where their, their hind parts are in the middle and their head is facing out. And they do this right before they, they molt and um, shed, shed their old skin so that they can, they can grow to their next size. So they get into this pattern and then they all shed their skin and then they turn back around and then they eat their skin. They leave the head capsule part. They don't like that, maybe too chewy, I don't know. But they eat the rest of it and then they go on with their day and they start munching on the host plant again. So they have some interesting behavior, which I thought was kind of cool. Okay. And uh, let's see, uh, these are the same uh, as the others where um, they, they prefer to, they prefer to pupate in the loose leaf litter and loose soil and that sort of thing. But if that's not super available, then they have been known to go into crevices of logs and rocks and, and pupate in that area also. So this is what the adult looks like. You can see it turns a lot more green. It gets these, these little spikes that are much more defined. Um, it's got this red and white stripe that goes down the side here. And this is what the cocoon looks like. And you can see what's kind of neat about this is this right here. I don't know if you can see my mouse. Hopefully you can see my, um, my mouse pointing right here. But to the uh, right of the little, the little body of this cocoon right here, you can see that this is the shed skin. And this is the head capsule right here. So you can kind of see that right here in this photo, which is neat. All right, so these are the hose plants and I put them all because there's a lot and um, some of the other moths are pretty specific in what they will host on. Um, these like a lot, um, so red maple, silver maple, all of these that I listed are um, plants that are native to Florida. All right, there's actually a really great website that I um, found. I don't know if I can, I don't know if I'll be able to show you. Maybe I can, yeah, I can. Okay, I brought it up here. So this website right here, um, you can search for, for a moth species or a butterfly species and you can find um, the host plants for it using this website, which is kind of cool. I've found that it's not super complete, but it's pretty good. So if you were interested in learning more about host plants, this website is really great for that, all right? So here's the web address right here. You can see that. Okay. All right. Let me go back to Sorry, I messed up my presentation. <laughs> Okay, so red maple, this is Eastern, wait, what is it? Eastern red bud. Um, 
Silver buttonwood is also a host plant, which is a really beautiful plant for landscaping purposes. Very attractive, makes a small tree. Um, that one's really cool, that's a host plant. Uh, flowering dogwood. This is red mulberry, which is one of my favorite things in my yard because, you know, produces edible fruits and it's, and it's awesome. I love it. Um, black cherry, I believe that one is. Um, Carolina willow is a host plant. Sassafras is a host plant. Um, and this one is do, 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 winged something. Hickory? Is it, is it hickory? Winged elm. This one is winged elm. You can see the wings on it right here. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Drew a blank there for a second because I didn't label them. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's got a ton of host plants. But these are um, you know, really cool. And, and what's neat about this is since they do have the spines, most of these host plants are trees. So it's not really going to be in grabbing distance, hopefully. <laughs> so I wouldn't be too scared to like maybe you know plant some of these things to have them in your yard because um, it's not likely you're going to reach that high up and, and grab it by accident but yeah so I think that's it for I think that's it for my slides all right Kaylee bear with me let's uh, get to your slides All right. All right. So I have the polyphemus moths, and let me pull up my notes here for the side here. So they're um, a very large moth. They grow up to about, uh, or, or the adult form is about six inches in size, and they're also another biomimicry specialist. They have those eye spots that warn and deter predators. They, they flip open their wings when they feel scared and they, you know, warn predators to stay away. Um, they're very common throughout all of North America and in every continental state, including uh, up into Canada as well. Um, and it was actually, I forgot to add it into the slide here, but it was named after um, Peter Kramer in 1776 for the Greek mythical Cyclops named Polyphemus. Um, I find a little funny because it does have two eye spots and it was named for a cyclops, but I digress. Um, some of the, um, oh, well, what I thought was interesting is that because they're so big, they can eat up to 86,000 times their weight in their first two months um, as a caterpillar. And uh, some of their native host plants are um, willow and oak maple, walnut, elm, hickory, um, plants like that, woody species, much like many of the other moths that we've gone over. Um, and I already mentioned about the eye spots there. So I have more pictures that show the um, larva form. Um, I didn't find any uh, information on like the, the name of the caterpillar form if it has a separate name. So I just went with poly polyphemus caterpillar. Um, and it reminds me of the caterpillar from A Bug's Life. Um, it's very chunky and cute. And then they make this interesting little um, cocoon. They spin it from silk um, and they include uh, like leaves, leaf matter and um, sticks. They, they have it on the end of a stick and uh, you can find it. It's like this tiny little sack that just kind of hangs out. And then they have a little opening at the top. They all seem to come out from the same um, end of the cocoon. And I think there's a couple more. There's a cute picture of it, you know, with its little legs, how it holds on to things. And then I wanted to show their, you know, the fluff that, as Gia mentioned, they're modified scales, but they come out and they literally look like feathers, I think. They, they look like little birds, I think. And um, 
their antenna are also very large. And also with the other moths, um, or like the other moths, the males have a bigger antenna for seeking out those females. And then I've got another picture that will show that beautiful eye spot, this detail um, and the, the speckling of white makes it to um, really pop out at night so that a predator can see and say, I don't want to eat that. So there's the caterpillar. Um, their hatchlings are yellow at first. And as they grow bigger um, throughout five molts, they grow to be big, chunky, and green with um, some silver spots along their sides. And uh, they can get up to about three to four inches long. Um, the adult form, um, the males have that feathery antenna. They detect the female pheromones and they can fly long distances so that they can um, find their mate. And then once they do, the um, female will lay her eggs. Um, I believe it was about three uh, clusters of eggs that they'll, they'll leave and uh, uh, then they die within a week because they mm. have a vestigial mouse, they don't eat anything. So once they become an adult, their life is pretty limited. And here is one of their hosts is a maple I showed. And then um, the American elm is another. The Carolina willow also is another one that they like. River birch, they like those too. It's another woody species. And also um, pignut hickory is another one that they like to uh, host on as the caterpillar. And then the um, adult moths, the female will lay her eggs on these plants. And, and also muscatine grape is another one that they like. And a lot of these plants are found in um, hydric, you know, wet areas. So I've mm -hmm. I noticed that things like uh, the plants that are found in those areas. So then that must be a more um, common habitat to find them in. So if you're in a wet flatwoods kind of area with these plants in your yard or in the area, you might end up finding these. Um, and I didn't find any uh, envenomation on them. I don't think that the polyphemus is venomous. Okay, next up is my saddleback caterpillar. Um, the moth is very kind of blase looking compared to the caterpillar. <laughs> the saddleback caterpillar is very well known for its ability to release toxins um, from the spines that are along its body. And the next picture I believe will show uh, what the larva form looks like there. Oh, I was mistaken. That's a pinned version of the adult. So you see its wings outstretched. They have, you know, very blah looking underwings as well. They're, they just want to hide in the leaf litter and look like leaves. Um, they're native to Eastern and Southern United States and also throughout Central America. So that's the caterpillar. They're so colorful when they're, you know, a larva and all of those, uh, bristles along the sides and its mouth parts and the fleshy horns on the top, uh, those uh, release a very powerful toxic um, venom. And it's very well known for people to be sent to the hospital for a severe reaction sometimes, but most often it just creates a rash and maybe some nausea, but it, it has the potential. Um, their native host plants are asters, blueberries, muscadine grapes, uh, maples, oaks, wild sunflowers, and viburnums as well, much like many others too. And so the caterpillar is that bright green, and then they've got the uh, brown spot kind of encircled in white on its back, and it resembles a saddle. So that's why they earned that name. And I think I think I've got another picture that will show another angle on the caterpillar. Oh, those are babies. Those are the teeny tiny babies. Um, I guess that's the first instar um, on them. That was from iNaturalist. So it's very interesting how they grow. And then they, in the right light, I guess they look a little, you know, shiny. Um, but they're 
very different from the larva form. I thought that that was very interesting how they can change so much like that, this chunky, leathery looking worm to, uh, you know, the fuzzy little guy over there. So they're actually a kind of slug caterpillar. Um, they're, you know, the brightly colored fleshy horns and they can do the rash. They grow up to about one inch. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, a interesting fact uh, is how they move. Like you can see they move like a, a little ripple and it's because they use um, mucus and suction cups to like stick onto things and then they release and it's a, 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 a little pattern of how they move themselves forwards. And then next up, I've got some of the host plants pictures that pop up over the screen there that you'll find them on. They like flowering dogwood is one of them. Um, Walter's, uh, I'm sorry, wild plum. I'm sorry, I had to really lean in close to read that. Wild plums. Um, I believe a Walter's viburnum is in there. That's why I mixed that up. Um, next one is, I believe, blueberries. I like those. And then the viburnum also. And a, um, what's that last one? Oh, a linden tree. A American linden or also called basswood. This is one that I wasn't aware of and I saw it in I thought that that was interesting, so I wanted to show it. It looks, you know, these very broad leaves that look like they would be a great host to, um, you know, caterpillars looking for a meal. All right. And next up is these guys are found mostly in, in like the upland areas. I found them in my yard, so that's why I knew of them and wanted to pick this teeny tiny little thing. Um, they're white and fuzzy little moths. They've got the orange stripes on their wings and they're only about 45 millimeters, which is like just a little over an inch and a half. Um, that's at their wingspan. Um, they're native to Florida and southern parts of the bordering states, Alabama and Georgia and Mississippi. Um, the caterpillars are, are bright orange um, with black and yellow bands and they they, they sort of look similar to a talus, um, in a way, but different. So they're distinguishable. If you know what you're looking at, you have them side by side, but they also feed on the same plants. Um, so the echo moth caterpillar, uh, I've got a picture to come up, up in one of these um, things on the side there. Um, they've got hairs on their bodies, but from what I could gather is I don't believe that they're venomous. Um, I could be wrong. Uh, I would typically err on the side of caution if I see a hairy caterpillar and say that's probably not safe to touch. So without information, I would say don't touch them. Um, so they feed on uh, arrowroots, kunti, uh, sable palmetto, crotons, there are native crotons, um, lupines, oaks, persimmons, and other woody plants like many of the other moths have uh, uh, picked. So, so they like um, palmetto thickets. Um, they, they, they will commonly found in a thicket or in scrub woods, open areas, and you can see them most commonly in uh, the spring through the fall. Um, I think I've got another couple of pictures to show that they're in the um, family of tiger moths. They're related to tiger moths um, with the striping that they've got, but uh, it is actually the only one in its genus, uh, Cyroptia, um, it's the only kind. And uh, there is a X-rated version of uh, moths doing their deeds to uh, figure out how to reproduce. And this is the beautiful wings. I loved the striping that they have. I thought that was funny. I had to add that. But you can see their wing stripes too, and the 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 fuzzy. Um, I forget the actual word for their body. I'm sorry, I'm not an entomologist, but uh, they also have those modified scales. 
um, for uh, some fuzz on their bodies. And they also have some feathery antennas as well. And the caterpillars, um, see they're, they're a bright orange um, with the yellow colors. And so the talas also look similar in that way, not as hairy, but they're found on the same plant. So someone might see it and say, what is this on my plant? Is this going to hurt my atalas? Um, it won't. Um, they can co coexist uh, happily. Just plant more cookies. <laughs> and so with them, they're uh, very hairy little things. And then the, um, the adults have orange legs with the, the black feet um, that they use to stick onto things. And similar with the other moths, the Males' antennas are more pronounced so that they can use them to sense their mates and uh, find their um, flowers because I, I learned afterwards and wasn't able to include it is that they do also nectar on um, some scrub species that I've um, looked around at, like uh, the yucca filamentosa when it flowers, as they'll be found in there too. And I've got pictures to show up next for the natives that they're hosts. Um, so the arrowroot, or also kunti, as many people know it as, uh, sable palmetto, or cabbage palm. And they also like lupines, which I think is a wonderful plant, but it's difficult to grow in a home garden. So if you have it in your yard, great. But um, don't worry too much about trying to plant it because you might stress yourself out too much. They also like Chapman's Oak. That's the um, plant that I found it on in my yard. Um, it's a, a scrubby species of oak. It also uh, does the color change during the fall, um, which I think is something that, you know, is kind of a pattern that we're finding with the moths. And they also like wild persimmon also, just like many others. And I think that that would conclude my end of the slides. Yes, thank you. And do we have any questions? Or questions? Yes, folks, uh, we that, that comes to the conclusion of our slides. If we have any questions live, please go ahead and type them into the chat box. Um, you know, we do always get these wonderful co uh, comments. You know, Kim, thanks, Kim, for your support. Appreciate you tuning in. Um, you know, Laura Zuro, uh, our native bee specialist, uh, tuned in. So she thanks us as well. Matthew Hopkins, who has been a longstanding supporter of Couple of Fern and all the online outreach that we do. Uh, he's, he's, I think, from the Gainesville area, not too far from there. So he enjoyed it uh, and also writes wonderful presentation. Thank you. Uh, Facebook user writes, game, great teamwork, well done, thank you. Uh, and Matthew again writes, excellent presentation. Um, folks, there is a huge variety of uh, moths out there. I mean, this is just not even, this is just a taste of a taste. I mean, there, there's a huge uh, diversity of them. Uh, all across the world, uh, even more so also in Florida, there's 300 plus species. I'm pretty sure that's actually on the low end. Um, but we just had to choose a few that we gravitated to um, and uh, some that are pretty common in gardening and that you will encounter. And I, we hope that some of these slides are useful to you and that you think of us uh, if you ever encounter one of these moths in your yard or green space. Uh, that concludes our presentation. Uh, please like us on Facebook and uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please do that, that's so important. So if you guys are watching on YouTube, uh, go ahead and uh, subscribe to it. That really is a free way of showing your support for what we do. Uh, you can always find us on Instagram and Facebook. Matter of fact, this live stream is being plugged into the Florida Native Gardening Group. So in case you are one of those 8,000 plus members, you're probably watching this through the group right now. And it's uh, largely because of people like Gia and Kaylee who have been toiling away in that group 
um, for years at this point, and, and it's just a labor of love for them. So thank you. And also go to fnps.org. So we're part of a couple of firms. We serve the Seminole County and uh, neighbor, neighboring areas, West Volusia, North Orlando bub uh, suburbs that bleed into Seminole County, Extreme North Brevard. Uh, but in case you are exclusively an online learner, uh, then we do recommend you join a couple of firms as well. So fnps.org slash join. Uh, we do have a few more comments at this point. Uh, Paula writes, great presentation. What are the little white moths that fly out of the grass when you walk in, in the morning? It could be a, a, a many different kinds. So Paula, um, you know, we can't really uh, pin down a species. We can't even pin down a family because it could be in the Cranberry family. It could be in the uh, related uh, snout moth family. Uh, there's a huge diversity of them out there. Uh, Kimberly says, loved it, my boys, and I learned a lot. Thank you. Jan Mangos, hey, Jan, uh, great presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, little Cadella writes, thank you, I learned a lot. Of course, we are very happy to do this. And again, um, you know, our presentations are meant for you to get out into nature and enjoy it and appreciate it and make a personal connection with it. Um, so that concludes our presentation, folks. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll see you another time.